Good day, dear great surgeon, Mr. Ovalot. So let's continue our interesting endocrine chapter together. We can. Dear great surgeon, take care. The parathyroid gland is important for our calcium and parathormone secretion. So, when should we remove a parathyroid gland? The parathyroid gland should be removed in a patient manifesting with parathyroid edema in asymptomatic patient or symptomatic patient. What? In asymptomatic patient? Yes, we would need parathyroidectomy in asymptomatic patient. If the patient is asymptomatic with a parathyroid adenoma, but he is below 50 years old with severe hypercalcemia and decreased glomerular filtrate and decreased bone density, go for parathyroidectomy. But if the patient is symptomatic, this is the more logic. He will be manifesting with renal symptoms like polydipsia, polyuria, nephrolithiasis, like renal stones. Lithiasis means stone. So whenever you find the word lithiasis in our body, it means stone. So nephrolithiasis is renal stone. And debilitating hyperparathyroid bone disease like osteitis fibrosis cystica, as well as pancreatitis caused by the parathyroid or ulcerative disease or GERD or significant neurocognitive dysfunction due to the parathyroid adenoma because the parathyroid will be manifesting with bone, moon, stone and GIT symptom. If it's caused by the parathyroid adenoma, go for the for parathyroidectomy. Another causes for the parathyroidectomy will be recurrent primary hyperpara or familiar syndrome like men when it's associated with men syndrome we all know that men 1 and men 2 is associated with hyperparathyroidism adenoma and uh, hyperplasia the parathyroid cancer although it's rare but if it occurs it's an indication as well as the parathyroid cri crisis these great surgeons take care we have three types of hyperparathyroidism primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary might be asymptomatic and recurrent abdominal pain might be occurring and change due to emotional and cognitive state because there is a problem, a real problem within the parathyroid itself and mostly due to a solitary adenoma in 80% of the cases. That's why the primary hyperparathyroidism would be surgical. The secondary hyperparathyroidism is due to a parathyroid gland hyperplasia which occur as a result of low calcium. So the problem is not within the secondary itself, it's not within the parathyroid itself. It's due to a chronic renal failure for example. While the tertiary occurs as a result of ongoing hyperplasia, a prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism which failed a medical therapy will be in, uh, eventually a tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So, primary hyperparathyroidism and tertiary hyperparathyroidism will be managed surgically, mainly. While the secondary hyperparathyroidism, the problem is not within the parathyroid gland, so we will manage medical therapy first. But when we need a secondary hyperparathyroidism surgical removal, if there is a bone pain persistent, pruritus or soft tissue calcification, those are the three indications for secondary hyperparathyroidism to be managed surgically. In the exam, he will not ask you about the general causes and or the general indications for the surgery. He will be directing you regarding it's a primary or secondary or tertiary. And by the way, he will track you with the labs. Because in primary hyperparathyroidism, you will find the parathormone elevated as well as the calcium. While in secondary hyperparathyroidism, you will find in the exam, there is a key noting that this is a patient of a chronic renal failure. With his parathormone elevated, but the calcium is low or normal. This is the trick. While the tertiary, you will find the parathormone is elevated, but he will tell you as well as the calcium is normal or high but the scenario will be ongoing that it's ongoing prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism denoting it's a tertiary hyperparathyroidism the trick will be regarding the labs in the exam it will trick you with the labs so the primary will be having the parathormone and calcium elevated with no renal element 
while the secondary hyperparathyroidism will tell you that he has a chronic renal failure and the parathormone elevated by the calcium is low. And regarding the parathyroid disease in the exam, may be only clue in your exam that it causes bone, mood, stone, and GIT manifestations. The mood may be like dissociative emotional cognitive state. He will be too emotional. So when you find an emotional patient in your clinic, he might be having a parathyroid and nobody noticing. And he will tell you that he has a GIT manifestations like uh, GIT cramping. This might be a primary hyperparathyroidism and nobody is noticing. Take care. So this is another lesson to never underestimate your patient complaint. So in the exam he will tell you a 60 year old man presented with recurrent renal stones or nephrodophiasis. He is found to have the calcium 2.7. This is elevated by the way. And a birth hormone about 12. This is also elevated. So calcium elevated, birth hormone elevated, old man, recurrent renal stone. This is primary hyperparathyroidism with nephrolithesis, which is indication for parathyroidectomy, as we all agree. Due to solitary adenoma in 80%, by the way. These great surgeons, we all agree that primary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism is, will be presenting with high parathormone and high calcium level. If the patient presented to you with hypercalcemia, what should you do? Don't manage the main management or the definitive management of the hyperparathyroidism surgically at this moment. You are dealing with the whole body. What is first is first. Deal with the first aid. Hypercalcemia requires rehydration. So give the patient of hypercalcemia intravenous fluid at once on site. Give him normal saline. A very famous trick in the exam is what to do next or the very next step. Hypercalcemia will be treated with IV normal saline 0.9%. You can use intravenous biphosphonate if the calcium is above 3. But the first thing to be done for hypercalcemia, IV normal saline in case you forgot which is secondary which is primary which is tertiary the tertiary is prolonged secondary but take care the primary is the top he will be topper in everything he will be topper in the parathormone he will be topper in the calcium while the secondary will be only topper in the parathormone and low in the calcium he will be secondary in the calcium to primary is high in everything in parathyroid while the secondary is secondary in everything in the parathyroid, especially the calcium will be low or no normal. So the trick in the exam will be regarding the secondary and the tertiary because we agree that the tertiary is a prolonged secondary. The secondary will be in the exam like a 70 year old woman with a back pain, chronic renal failure, presenting with hypocalcemia and high parth hormone. This is a secondary hyperparathyroidism, but this is not the trick. The trick will be in the same patient if he has undergone a renal transplant for end stage renal failure. He will be presenting with, yes, the calcium might be normal or high because the renal can't get rid of the calcium. This is the prolonged renal failure. How could it be manifesting? And he had a renal transplant. So this indicates this patient had been living with the hyperparathyroidism, the secondary hyperparathyroidism for a long time. So that's it. This is the tertiary due to hyperplasia of the gland. This is a tertiary hyperparathyroidism and the management will be surgically. So it's not normal in the secondary hyperparathyroidism which is a patient with chronic renal failure to having a high calcium. If you found a high calcium with high parathormone and it's not a primary case with chronic renal failure, so this might be indicating a tertiary. 
So a chronic renal failure with high calcium and high parathormone, this is most probably a tertiary. If he told you this patient have a renal transplant, so he has been going through a long time for chronic renal failure. This is also a prolonged secondary, so this is tertiary. Hope this topic is clear because there is a question in the exam about this topic. للناس اللي بتتكلم العربي يبقى احنا عندنا ثلاث حاجات برايمري سكندري تيرشري في الامتحان هيجي لك حاجه من اثنين يا اما هتلاقي الباراثورمون والكالسيوم عالي يبقى انت بتفكر ما بين البرايمري والتيرشري والاثنين هتعالجهم سيرجيكالي هتفرق ما بينهم ازاي ان البرايمري مش هيكون معاه رينال فيلير فانت لما تلاقي الباراثورمون عالي هو والكالسيوم وما فيش رينال فيلير يبقى انت تتكلم على برايمري لكن انت لو لقيت كرونيك رينال فيلير موجود وفي كالسيوم عادي وباراثورمون عالي يبقى ده تيرشري لان السكندري احنا متفقين ان في كرونيك رينال فيلير وده هيكون الكي بتاعنا والكالسيوم هيكون قليل او نورمال طب لقيت ان الكالسيوم نورمال ولقيت الباراثورمون عادي انا كده متلخبط هو دوت سكندري ولا تيرشري هيجي يقول لك ان ده عنده كرونيك رينال فيلير وعمل رينال ترانسبلانتيشن يبقى انت كده قلت ان الراجل ده بقاله برولونجت سكندري يبقى احنا كده في الاغلب بنتكلم على ايوه نتكلم على تيرشري ارجو انها تكون وضحت لان سؤال على الجزئيه دي هيكون جاي في الامتحان باي ذا واي دونت بانيك فروم ذا برسنتج ان ذا اكزام ذا مور يو سولف ذا مور يو ويل جيت ات يو ويل سيف يور تايم باي ميمورايزنج ذا برسنتج بات ات ويل بي ريفيرد اند فاوند از ان ذا اكزام يو ويل فايند ذا ريفرنس رينج ويذن ذا اكزام سو نو وريز Dear great surgeon, in every exam of MRCS, there will be a question about the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone Sayeda causes or manifestations. So, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone or Sayeda will be asked in the exam. So, let's be familiar what can cause this syndrome. Malignancy or neurological or infection or drugs. Like malignancy, for example, the small cell lung cancer, as well as the pancreas or prostate. Neurological causes like the stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, even meningitis and encephalitis, as well as the abscess. Yes, all of those can cause syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. As well as infection like TB and pneumonia, drugs like sulfonylurea, tricyclines, carbamazepine, Vincristine, cyclophosphamide, all of those can cause syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Other causes may be the positive end expiratory pressure, like one is ventilated by the way, or porphyria. Those are the causes for the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. But what is the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion? What is it? It's a condition where our body makes too much antidiuretic hormone. This hormone helps the kidney to control the amount of water your body loses during urination. So, Sayeda syndrome will cause the body to retain much water. You will be a water balloon due to antidiuretic hormone excess from the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. How can we diagnose a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone in the exam? There will be hyponatremia and the urine less than maximally dilution where inappropriately concentrated as well as the patient will be euvolemic includes the absence of congestive heart failure, even cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome. Absence of renal or adrenal or thyroid insufficiency. There will be a urinary sodium which you more than 20 millimole per deciliter, probably as a consequence of increased atrial nitritic factor. And the dynamic testing and the plasma ADH level are usually unnecessary in the diagnosis. So, the patient will be hyponatremia and the urinary sodium will be high. So, we'll be losing our blood sodium in our urine. But the patient will have urine less than the maximum dilution, inappropriately concentrated. And the patient will be euvolemic.
there will be no congestive heart failure or no cirrhosis and no nephrotic syndrome. And by the way, there will be absence of renal or adrenal or thyroid insufficiency. So let's talk with the exam terms. He will give you a hyponatremic patient with serum osmolarity is low and urine osmolarity is high. This is Sayeda. This is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Again, hyponatremia and low serum osmolarity as well as high urine osmolarity. This means this patient have a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion and you are retaining much water and losing all the sodium. That's why we have high urine osmolarity. Again, regarding the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone criteria, there will be hyponatremia. There will be no hypokalemia at all and no acid-base disorder. We are talking all about sodium. It's all about sodium and osmolarity. The urine osmolarity will be high. The serum osmolarity will be low. While the serum sodium will be low, there will be hyponatremia, but there is no hypokalemia. There is nothing to do with the potassium. It's all about the sodium with the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic syndrome. Dear great surgeon, thyroid chapter is very important and critical in the exam. Many questions come directly from this chapter in the exam, and there is no MRCS exam without thyroid. So let's be familiar with the most common disorders of the thyroid in MRCS exam. We all know the goiter, which is enlargement of the thyroid gland, and we all know the hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid hormone, or the hyperthyroidism and thyroid toxicosis, where we have a hyper secretion of the thyroid gland, whatever its cause. If it's primary, it will be gravid. If it's secondary, it will be plumber's decay. So, is there autoimmune diseases for the thyroid? Yes, there is autoimmune. It's called thyroiditis. We have the subacute thyroiditis and the Hashimoto thyroiditis and many thyroiditis. So, those are autoimmune diseases. The trick in the exam regarding every disease in the thyroid have to be taken care of because the exam won't ask you about a solid information in the thyroid but instead he will focus on the tracks of the thyroid and believe me together we can crack them all. If you are familiar with the Hashimoto thyroiditis where the immunological disorder to the lymphocyte becomes sensitized to thyroidal antigen the three most important antibodies of the Hashimoto, the thyroglobin, and TBO and TSH are During the early phase of Hashimoto, the thyroglobin antibody is markedly elevated and then decline And the feature of the Hashimoto will be the goiter We are talking about the goiter in surgery and nothing but the goiter That makes the surgeon alert A swelling which is in thyroid will be the goiter So in Hashimoto, there will be a goiter Either eothyroid or mild hypothyroidism. This will make you think of the Hashimoto as well as the progressive hypothyroidism with its associated symptoms. And the management of the Hashimoto during the hyperthyroid phase of illness, beta blocker may be managing the whole thing. As the hypothyroidism develop, the patient will require thyroxine. So the Hashimoto will tell you a scenario of the patient. He started as hyperthyroid, then became hypothyroid. This is Hashimoto. The problem in the exam regarding the Hashimoto is not the hypo or hyperthyroidism management. He will trick you regarding the association with thyroid lymphoma. So take care. The thyroid lymphoma non Hodgkin B cell lymphoma is rare, but it's associated with the Hashimoto thyroiditis. So it should be considered in a patient with a background of Hashimoto thyroiditis and the rapid growth inside of the thyroid gland, this is lymphoma associated with Hashimoto and it has marker called thyroglobulin and the TBO and TSH are all are antibodies required for diagnosis of Hashimoto so Hashimoto remember lymphoma the diagnosis can be made with fine needle aspiration core needle biopsy however incisional biopsy may be needed and radiotherapy is the main treatment option for the thyroid lymphoma due to 
Hashimoto. This great sir, regarding any thyroid disease, you have a triple assessment have to be done. The history, examination including the ultrasound, and the fine needle is essential. So we have three things to be done. History, ultrasound, and fine needle. Take care, the radionucleotide scanning is of limited use. So if he told you that there is a patient complaining of a goiter and we have done ultrasound, what you should do next? Whatever the result in the ultrasound, go for fine needle. By the way, the breast is just like the thyroid. Triple assessment, history, examination including ultrasound or mammography or even MRI. This is called radiological assessment and we have to do biopsy. There is no thyroid, there is no breast without triple assessment. History examination including radiology, third to be done is fine needle for thyroid and biopsy for breast. By the way, you have to do labs for thyroid. There is no thyroid without labs. Just remember the hepatopillary, there is no hepatopillary intervention or cholecystitis to be assessed without the labs. For the thyroid, you do the thyroid profile. For the hepatopillary, you have to do the liver profile including the pilirubin and liver function. Take care. This is the next to do as well. Never to forget this. By the way, in the thyroid, toxicity rules out malignancy. Again, toxicity rules out malignancy if you found someone to be hot and toxic it's better to be cold and suspense this might be thyroid cancer so if you found that someone having a hot solitary nodule this is toxic adenoma take care this is a good thing better to be die from thyroid toxicosis than from a cold cancer no one dies from thyroid toxicosis if he managed well, but a neglected thyroid cancer can cause death. And cancer is cold, never go toxic. Very rare to be toxic. Very rare to be hot. Be hot, don't be cold. So if any old lady came to you with thyroid toxicosis or toxic nodule, congratulate her and greet her and say to her, congratulations. You will not die from thyroid cancer because you are toxic and hot. She will slap you in the face, but you know that she will live long life and live happily ever after. So regarding toxic goiter, we have primary thyrotoxicosis and secondary thyrotoxicosis. The primary thyrotoxicosis goiter is Graves' disease, while the secondary thyrotoxic goiter is the Blumer's disease. Primary means is the problem within the thyroid itself. It came on a clean thyroid enlargement. You will find it smooth with no pre-existing thyroid disease. While the secondary thyrotoxicosis come over a nodular goiter. Not over a smooth goiter. And the management of the gravest disease will be mainly medical. While the secondary will be mainly surgical. This reminds us of the parathyroid. The parathyroid gland is behind the thyroid gland. Although the primary parathyroidism, the primary hyperparathyroidism managed surgically, while the primary thyroid toxicosis is managed medically. Is it a coincidence? No. You have to take care of this. Enjoy your medicine. Two glands behind each other. The primary thyrotoxicosis managed medically, while the primary hyperparathyroidism managed surgically. Medicine is weird. They are neighbors. They should follow each other. But everyone has his own identity. Thyroid is thyroid. Parathyroid is parathyroid. Not every primary managed medically. Not every primary managed surgically. The primary hyperparathyroidism managed surgically. The primary thyrotoxicosis managed medically in and if failed, go for surgery. Let's have some advice for our fellow men. If you are going to marry a pretty lady, take care. When you enter her house to ask her father for marriage, ask him, please, dear father, I want to check the pulse of your daughter. Go for her, 
check her hands if she is sweaty with rabbit balls looking to you in your eyes and he ha she have a big eye she is sweating she is thin think of her as thyroid toxicosis she has exosomes go flee with yourself don't marry this woman she is thyroid toxic you will have her neck is enlarged this is goiter this is not neck of venus this is not endemic goiter how can a 30 year old lady have a goiter at this age except it's thyroid toxic or nodular or cancerous go free with yourself please save yourself and by the way if you enter the home of this pretty lady and found her neck is enlarged her brother has enlarged neck her father and her mother had enlarged neck as well this might be medullary carcinoma running in the family and they are negligent people don't care for their neck and think of it as endemic goiter a venous neck no this might be a medullary carcinoma running in the family take care this is a typical scenario of medullary carcinoma in which the chromocytoma may also be present it may be inherited as an autosomal dominant her father her mother her brother all of the family having medullary carcinoma all the family member will be affected would you marry a medullary carcinoma female unless you are going to do some surgeries on her go for it it will be a big deal but take care if you decided to marry a medullary carcinoma female search for the foie chromocytoma for the men too and the man is a foie chromocytoma before the medullary carcinoma to live happily ever after for a while you can also search for the calcitonin if you are not sure and don't believe in science that medullary carcinoma running in family but take care the calcitonin is for the follow up it's not diagnostic it's a prognostic after removal of the thyroid medullary carcinoma search for the calcitonin but before even if it's large if it's high it's not diagnostic at all it's a prognostic you can search for it before the surgery and after the surgery because it's secreted due to the medullary carcinoma so not every tall female is a sign of beauty she might be marfanoid and might be a men to syndrome take care she might be getting you to marry a medullary carcinoma lucky female with the chromocytoma and marfanoid men to p take care in your clinic try to choose your patient if you have a medullary carcinoma patient and follicular carcinoma patient and papillary carcinoma patient which one you choose the medullary carcinoma will give you the her whole family to do medullary carcinoma thyroidectomy but this is after the fake chromocytoma so you have to be talented in the fake chromosoma adrenalectomy and the medullary carcinoma thyroidectomy if you are not familiar with those two operations and how to manage them and you want your patient to be living after the operation go for the follicular or the papillary especially the papillary carcinoma because the papillary thyroid cancer are the most common type of thyroid cancer so you will get a lot of patient and by the way the papillary carcinoma is spread through the lymphatic route and this gives you a better chance to live with a better lifestyle and life expectancy it's more common in females than men by ratio 10 to 1 so papillary tumors are most likely to develop through the lymphatic spread than the follicular carcinoma that's why a better prognosis the follicular carcinoma in the contrast will be having the hematogenous spread and this will lead to a pathological fracture so in your clinic you have to have a friend of orthopedic surgery for the bone fractures that will come to you from your follicular carcinoma friend to treat your patient but if you have no orthopedic surgeon in your clinic go for papillary carcinoma this whole scenario to make sure that you understand that papillary of better prognosis papillary lymphatic spread follicular hematogenous spread papillary have a pathological fracture and the scenario in the exam will tell you that there is a patient who have a thyroid swelling and have many pathological fracture think of follicular carcinoma 
By the way, to detect the recurrence of thyroid cancer after thyroidectomy, you can follow it up with thyroglobal antibodies for any thyroid cancer like follicular carcinoma, papillary carcinoma, while the medullary carcinoma follow-up is by the serum calcitonin. These great surgeon, take care. There is a subtype from the follicular carcinoma called Herthel cell thyroid cancer. This is a subtype from the follicular thyroid cancer but of very bad prognosis. Take care. Although we agreed that we have a triple assessment for breast and thyroid and profile of thyroid, take care that the fine needle in the thyroid gland is not conclusive for the follicular carcinoma because it doesn't differentiate between the follicular adenoma and the follicular carcinoma and especially a subtype like the heart cell. That's why the fine needle aspiration is of limited use. And here we have to stand. Should I do total thyroidectomy or semi-thyroidectomy or hemi-thyroidectomy? Should I remove the half of the gland or the whole gland? We have two theories. According to EMRCS, we tend to remove the whole thyroid gland if we have a nodule bigger than 2 cm. If it's below 2 cm, go for hemithyroidectomy where you remove half of the thyroid gland with the isthmus. So again, if you have a thyroid cancer or a suspicious thyroid nodule and you want to know to do a thyroidectomy or hemithyroidectomy, the cut-off number will be 2 cm according to the EMRCS. I know if you read through the past this, you will find 4 cm. But lay go logic. Total thyroidectomy is better than re-exploration of the neck, but we follow the guidelines in the UK. So the cut the cut off number will be two centimeter. Below two centimeter, go for hemithyroidectomy. Above two centimeter, go for total thyroidectomy, even if it's found in one loop. And of course, this is regarding to the tumors. But if we have a thyrotoxic patient, he have to be euthyroid before the operation. Take care. There is no one enter the thyroid operation with his thyrotoxic states otherwise you want him dead after the operation from thyrotoxic crisis so now how could we control thyrotoxicosis we have two types of patient a non-pregnant female or pregnant female this is thyrotoxicosis simply a non-pregnant male or female yes you hear this correct non-pregnant male or female we are living in a bad age by the way where you can find a pregnant male god save us all save yourself dear doctors so regarding a pregnant he will be managed if cytotoxic with propylthyroracil and pita blocker and if non-pregnant give him carbamazole and beta blocker and take care anyone removes his thyroid gland he will require thyroxin for his long life he will be living on everyday tablet of thyroxin by the way in old females they can't withstand surgery or difficult to prepare them for surgery especially if they have thyroid cancer of course there is no endemic venous neck goiter in a 70 year old female it must be a cancer Otherwise, let's change our medical career. So this is cancer. If you can't withstand the operation for any reason, go for chemical thyroidectomy through the radioactive iodine. Radioactive iodine in the chemical thyroidectomy can be offered for all ladies that can't withstand the surgery. But it's not preferred in females, especially the young females. Surgery is better than radioactive iodine in young females. Another thing you want to know about the thyroid. Any thyroid enlargement in a male is a cancer factor in itself. In males, thyroid or breast enlargement is a cancer until proven otherwise. Deal with it as an aggressive cancer. There is no man supposed to have a breast mass. There is no man supposed to have a thyroid swelling. The incidence is very low. 
and any male have any swelling in the thyroid or the breast, deal with it as it's cancer until proven otherwise. Now, let's have some tricky question regarding thyroid goiter. If you have a female patient with a retrosternal goiter, either primary or secondary, which have a compression symptoms, this should be removed. See, we have a primary goiter. Graves disease, but it's retrosternal causing compression symptom. You have to remove this goiter. Save this female. For a long standing goiter, especially if retrosternal, you will go for total thyroidectomy. Okay, go for total thyroidectomy. But take care. This patient has been long standing goiter that might cause tracheomalacia and thus consider tracheostomy that might be needed for tracheomalacia. What is tracheomalacia? Malacia means softness and trachea from the trachea, your airway. So there will be softness of the trachea due to the continuous, continuous persistent compression by the goitrogenic thyroid gland because it's sited over the trachea. This will cause narrowing in the airway, by the way, and might be collapsing after the thyroid gland removal during thyroidectomy. So, even the thyroid long-standing goiter cause the tracheomalacia and cause softness, the removal of the thyroid gland will cause a collapse in this airway. So you will need tracheostomy to persistent and support this airway for a while. And then you can remove it after this. If you clinically can distinguish the end of the goiter with your clinical examination, go for the patient and ask him to manifest the Bumberton sign. Let's try to gather the Bumberton sign and let's ask our patient to manifest the Bumberton sign to detect is he having a retrosternal goiter or we are imagining it. Ask the patient to raise his both arm over his head until they touch his ears. This position is maintained for a while you will notice that there is a condition of the face and distress become evident in the case of the retrosternal goiter due to the obstruction of the great veins at the thoracic inlet. This is the Pemberton sign manifested due to the compression by the retrosternal goiter over the great vessels. Try it yourself, but I'm sure you don't have a retrosternal goiter. Or I hope so, otherwise you can Write down your number and let's have some surgery fun together in the next OR. God save you. This is a Pumperton sign. Pumperton sign reminds me of a patient who didn't pray his whole life and came to your clinic and you ask him to raise his hand to God. He will tell you, oh doctor, I didn't pray my whole life and you are a good man. You are asking me to pray. You tell him no. I am manifesting Pumperton sign because you have a retrosternal goiter. So now you can pray and manifest the Pumperton sign both as well in the same thing. Dear great surgeon, if I told you that we have a patient, he is thyrotoxic and having a goiter, with just looking at him, can you tell me, is he gravis or plumber disease? Is he primary thyrotoxic gravis or she is a secondary plumber thyrotoxic? How can you tell? Simply the eye sign. The eye sign exophthalmus will be with Graves' disease. This is due to the autoimmune manifestation by the Graves' disease. This is a very tricky, critical question in the exam. Keep it in mind. So that's why the TSH receptor antibody will cause stimulation of the thyroid to sensitize T4. However, this will have a negative feedback effect on the pituitary, causing decrease in the TSH levels. Where hyperthyroidism occurs secondary to pregnancy, the TSH will typically be elevated. So take care. What are the eye signs with Graves' disease? Let's be familiar with the very famous eye signs common with Graves' disease. There will be a Rosenbach sign where a tremor on closing the eyelid, and the still back sign, which is a staring block, and then rimbal sign, where a rim of sclera will be seen between the cornea and the upper lid. If in case you forget your eye look, go for the mirror 
and you will never see a rim of sclera between your cornea and the upper lip. This is a dead rimble sign, while the bone gravy sign is a lagging of the upper eyelid. When he looked down, there will be a lagging in looking down from the upper eyelid with coordination of his eye. He will, his eye will look down fast, but his upper eyelid will be lagging. This is bone gravy lagging sign. And the Jufroy sign is the loss of the forehead corrugation when looking up. This patient didn't do Botox. He had a thyrotoxicosis. Jufroy sign is a free Botox done without even a Botox for a patient of thyrotoxicosis. He didn't go for a uh, plastic surgeon or a dermatologist to put Botox. He had his own thyrotoxic crisis that made him have his own Botox free from Geoffroy sign with losing of forehead corrugation when looking up. And the Mopia sign is lack of convergence due to ocular myopathy. Those are the main signs that come with Graves disease. Rosenbach sign tremors, still vague sign staring look, he will be looking at you very sharply. He is not looking sharply, it's his disease. This is still vague signs staring look. And the dare rimble sign with rim of sclera and bone graphy lagging sign as well as the Jufroy botox forehead corrugation loss and the movia sign lack of convergence due to ocular myopathy. Any of those signs will denote this patient have a gravest disease due to autoimmune manifestation. We talked a lot about the autoimmune manifestation of the gravest disease. Is there any cutaneous manifestation of hyperthyroidism other than the eye signs? Yes, there will be a warm, moist, smooth skin, flushing, balmer eczema, hyperhidrosis, diffuse scalp hair selling, onychicosis, and pretibial myxedema. Take care from the pretibial myxedema as well as the thyroid acropathy, generalized pruritus, chronic urticaria. I want you to focus on the pretibial myxedema as well as the eye signs. I want to stress on the pretibial myxedema because in the hypothyroidism you might find that there is a dermal myxedema, non betting edema due to glycosaminoglycan. And as well, in the thyrotoxicosis of Graves disease autoimmune manifestation, there will be a peritibial myxedema. This is the trick. So hypothyroidism will be manifesting as a lazy banda, while the thyrotoxic will be very sharp person, but they have a common manifestation, myxedema. The peritibial myxedema with the thyrotoxicosis and the dermal myxedema with the hypothyroidism. Don't confuse them and the other signs will be your guide. Lastly but not least regarding our thyroid syndromes. Take care we have sick eothyroid syndrome. The sick eothyroid syndrome is manifesting when any acute severe illness in the body can cause abnormalities of circulating TSH or thyroid hormone level in the absence of underlying thyroid disease. There will be no thyroid disease, but there will be alteration in the thyroid hormones. Take care. The major cause is the release of the cytokine interleukin-6. Most common pattern will be low T3 syndrome and low in the total and the free T3 while the levels with normal T4 and TSH. This is sick eothyroid syndrome. How can you manage the eothyroid sick syndrome? By managing the precipitating illness. There is no treatment for the thyroid. There is no problem with the thyroid. And Sangha, the TSH and T4 are normal, but the T3 will be low. Let's talk about the congenital anomalies of the thyroid gland. Here we can see the overlap between the embryology, endocrinology, and pediatric surgery. The famous congenital anomalies of the thyroid are thyroid agenesis, where there is a failure of formation of thyroid gland, or lingual thyroid, where there is a failure of the thyroid to descend and become in the tongue, and apparent thyroid retrostinogoiter, where there is an over-descent of the thyroid gland in the thorax. And we talked about the retrostinogoiter and the pemberton sign. And let's talk now about a very famous congenital anomalies which beloved from all general and pediatric surgeons, the thyroglossal cyst. 
How to differentiate between the thyroglossal cyst and thyroid nodule, especially if the patient didn't manifest you at childhood and came to you in adolescence with thyroid nodule? We all know to know that there is a thyroid goiter. You ask the patient to, yes, swallow water or swallow his saliva. You will notice there is a movement of the thyroid gland enlarged with deglutition. While the thyroglossal cyst will move only in protrusion of the tongue. Ask the, your patient to protrude his tongue. He will look to you a uh, weird look. But tell him, trust me, I am a doctor. I want you to protrude your tongue. You are not a dog. You are protruding your tongue to know is it a thyroglossal cyst or is this a thyroid. He will raise his tongue for you. But you will notice is it a thyroglossal cyst or a thyroid gland. If it moves with protrusion of the tongue, this is a thyroglossal cyst. If it didn't move with protrusion of the tongue, the patient won the competition and protruded his tongue to you, and you lose your competition, and this is a thyroid gland. By the way, the thyroglossal cyst is not treated with thyroidectomy. Take care, thyroglossal cyst is a congenital anomaly due to persistence of a part of the thyroglossal duct, so you have to remove it with a famous operation called cyst trunk operation, where you remove the cyst, the tract, and a part of the hyoid bone. And this is a very common record question, by the way. If anything I want to add regarding the thyroid malignancy will be that in papillary carcinoma we have a very famous sign called orphan any sign. The nuclei of the samoma body will be called orphan any eye. This is with papillary carcinoma and frequently ask a direct question in the exam. Just like the reed Sternberg cell in the lymphoma. So orphan any eye with papillary carcinoma. Why reed Sternberg cell with the lymphoma? And the heart cell is a follicular carcinoma subtype, which is a very bad prognosis. If you are watching Batman series, you will find the Riddler. So let's tell me the Riddle. The Riddle thyroiditis or Riddle thyroiditis. It's a rare colonic inflammatory disease in the thyroid gland characterized by a dense fibrosis that replaces the normal thyroid parenchyma. The fibrotic process invades the adjacent structure of the neck and extend beyond the thyroid capsule. When you pinch the skin, it will be attached to the thyroid. This is a renal thyroiditis. When you tap over the thyroid in the renal thyroiditis, you will find it a woody, wood-like, if you are tapping on the wood. Can you hear it? There is a renal thyroiditis. The cancer most probably will be firm or soft. But a riddle, it will be woody because there is a dense fibrosis. This is our riddle. So whenever you watch a Batman series and watch the Riddler, remember the riddle thyroiditis. And when you pinch the skin and the examiner asks you why you pinch the skin over the thyroid gland, what are you expecting? You are telling him, I am denoting, is this a cancer invading the skin or this a a riddle thyroiditis with a dense fibrosis that attach it to the skin or not. Why we are telling you regarding the riddle thyroiditis? Because its a clinical evaluation demonstrates a hard fixed thyroid mass simulating thyroid neoplasm. It will be a very hard operation to be done due to the massive fibrosis. Hope you are not the lucky surgeon or you are the most talented surgeon when you face a case of free thyroiditis. That's it for today and hope you liked this lecture until we meet again. Yours, Dr. Pishore.